Greetings, and welcome to another episode of The Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and I'm pleased that you've chosen to spend some of your time today listening to me talk about military history. Today we're going to continue our look at the career of the famous U.S. Navy dive bomber, Douglas SBD Dauntless. Last time we looked at the development of the dive bomber concept during the decades between the World Wars and the types of aircraft that were built to meet these evolving requirements. Sources for this episode will be the same two used in the first episode, namely SBD Dauntless Units of World War II by Barrett Tillman and Douglas SBD Dauntless by Peter C. Smith. The last time we looked at the 20 years of testing, development, and tactical experimentation that went on in the interwar Navy. These had produced a steadily improving aviation capability for the Navy that, by 1941, had produced the aircraft familiar to students of the first part of the Pacific War, among them the new Dauntless. So, with that said, let's go to the United States of the years just before Pearl Harbor, where the new plane was just beginning to enter squadron service with the Navy and the U.S. Marines. So, as we saw in the last episode, Prototype XSBD-1, which appeared in August 1938, was still very much an incomplete product. Range and speed were less than was hoped for, but the aircraft was chosen for development anyway, it being assumed that the normal process of development work would solve the aircraft's issues in the fullness of time, and that the necessary improvements incorporated in the new production models or retrofitted into early series machines. Above all, the Navy wanted to get some of these aircraft into service as soon as possible in order to begin accumulating operational experience with modern carrier bombers. The expectations were fulfilled, and between the evaluation of the prototype and the completion of the first production model, many changes had been made to the original design. The initial production model was designated SBD-1, and the first of these new machines rolled off the production line at El Segundo in April 1940. The chief differences from the prototype was the use of an upgraded mark of the right R-1820 radial engine, the Dash 32 mark, which was rated at 1,000 horsepower. Other notable changes included the provision of two 15-gallon auxiliary fuel tanks, bringing the plane's total fuel capacity to 210 gallons or 795 liters, stretching the bomber's effective range. Also, the production SBD's gun armament was increased by the addition of a second fixed forward-firing 50 caliber machine gun. First SBD-1 made its maiden flight on the 1st of May, 1939, and was delivered on the 6th of September. Shortly after this, it was accepted for service, like the rest of the initial production batch, by the Marines. While this was happening, of course, tremendous events were taking place in Europe. In successive Blitzkrieg campaigns, the German war machine had overrun and conquered the countries of Poland, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland, and finally France itself. Instrumental to the German victories was the revolutionary tactical use of the Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber, which in conjunction with the fast-moving mechanized formations had totally disrupted the defenses of the armies of Europe. Not only that, but the Germans and the British fleet air arm had also demonstrated beyond doubt the grave threat that these types of strike aircraft posed to ships at sea, both warships and merchant vessels alike. The Stuka's attack profile, and much of its specialized bombing equipment, were almost identical to that developed over the course of the U.S. Navy's interwar experiments with the technique. Unquestionably, the advocates of the Navy's specialized dive bomber program have been proven exactly right in their estimation of the unparalleled potential of this mode of attack. Not only the U.S. and European towers took note of this important development, the Japanese had invested heavily in the dive bomber idea themselves, and had had ample opportunity to test their usefulness in the seven years of their military encroachment in China. They were possessed of one of the best aircraft in the world in this category, the Aichi D-3A, which is known to the Americans as the VAL, a radial engine, fixed gear dive bomber designed to fly from the Imperial Navy's large and growing fleet of aircraft carriers. To the officers of the U.S. Army, however, developments in Europe had been more troubling. The U.S. Army, which was still very small, had a proportionally tiny armored force. The aviation branch of this service, the U.S. Army Air Corps, had no dive bombers at all. Instead, it employed attack airplanes for ground support. These were not dive bombers, but instead single or twin-engine aircraft intended for low-level strafing and level bombing missions. Attack aviation was the smallest part of the U.S. Army's air effort, the doctrine of which was focused on the use of large, multi-engine bombers to strike at the enemy's war potential from long range, rather than on tactical ground support of the Army. The two types of aircraft were also employed by the British and French Air Forces in the battles of 1939 and 1940, and their effect on the campaigns had been negligible. This did not bode well for the U.S. Army should it find itself in combat with forces like those the Germans had used in their victories. The first production SBDs differed little from the prototype XSBD-1. In terms of appearance, the biggest difference would have been noticed in the nose, which now featured a prominent air intake for the carburetor as well as a groove for the second 50 caliber gun. 
Radio mass was moved back somewhat behind the engine firewall and wing area was slightly increased. The extra fuel tankage had increased the range from just over 600 miles or 975 kilometers to 860 miles or almost 1400 kilometers. This increase in capability came with increased vulnerability to enemy fire, however, as the additional tanks were not self-sealing. These changes resulted in a slightly increased weight, which also brought small reductions in maximum speed and service sealing. Range was still considered inadequate for carrier operations, and so the initial production batch of Dash-1 model SBDs was delivered to the Marine Corps to operate from land bases. The first squadron to receive these planes was VMB-2. Marine squadron nomenclature was like that used by the regular Navy squadrons, where V indicates heavier than air aviation, M stands for Marine, and B for bombing. These first planes arrived here in mid-1940. VMB-1, serving on the East Coast, also received SBD-1s. This unit later moved to McCalla Field at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, where the new aircraft were used to practice simulated carrier landings. The last of the SBD-1s was delivered on December 18, 1940. 57 of this model were produced. In addition to the stateside units, some ended up in the hands of Marine Air Group 21, which was based in Hawaii later in 1941. Service soon showed problems with the new plane. A potentially serious problem was noted after diving practice began. Wrinkles began to appear in the aircraft's skin near the wing roots. This could be an indication of dangerous structural weakness, and so help for the Douglas Company was requested to identify and correct the problem. Ed Heinemann, chief designer of the SBB, was dispatched to Cuba to see what could be done. Information gathered from careful observations and camera data revealed that the stress was coming not from the dive or any other flight maneuver, but from landing. The SBD's sink rate on landing was substantial, and the wrinkling was due to the heavy impact forces encountered on touchdown. This was corrected by the addition of an aluminum stiffening piece which reinforced the point of stress, and while this made for a heavier jolt on landing, it stopped the wrinkling. These stiffeners were incorporated into later models. Production of the next model began with the 58th aircraft off the line. This swapped out the auxiliary tanks with additional 65-gallon tanks located in the outer wing panels. This brought the range of the new plane, dubbed the SBD-2, more in line with Navy requirements for carrier bombers. In dive bomber configuration, carrying a 1,000 pound bomb on the center line bombing crutch and a pair of 100 pounders under the wings, it can make 1,125 miles or more than 1,800 kilometers. Loaded up for scout bomber duty, with only half of this bomb load, the range was 1,370 miles or 2,200 kilometers. Another aid for long overwater flight was incorporated into this model in the form of an autopilot. Although range was now more than satisfactory, the weight of the extra fuel further degraded the speed and rate of climb of the machine. In order to compensate for this, one of the forward-firing machine guns was sometimes removed. Otherwise, the external appearance of the Mark II was hardly changed from the Mark I. The Mark II was still considered somewhat unsatisfactory, however, but 87 were accepted for carrier service anyway in order to gain experience with the type of board ship while development went on. The first of these was delivered on the same day as the last Dash 1 model, that is, on December 18, 1940. These aircraft became operational by mid-1941. By the time of Pearl Harbor, the Dauntless equipped the dive bomber and scout bomber squadrons aboard the Pacific Fleet's two carriers. VB-2 and VS-2, sometimes called Bombing-2 and Scouting-2, flew from the USS Lexington, and VB-6 and VS-6 were based on the USS Enterprise. They replaced the BT-1s and Vought Vindicators previously embarked on these vessels. Unintentionally foreshadowing events to come, the SDDs of Lexington's air group would participate in a simulated attack on Oahu, May of 1941. A puzzling problem emerged as the Dash 2 began to accumulate hours in the air. The airplane was stalling at a considerably higher speed than the previous model. While this was a mystery at first, as nothing in the aircraft specifications had changed which can account for this strange aerodynamic behavior. The issue proved to be connected with the aircraft's paint job. A tiny ridge was formed where the yellow paint used on the top of the wing surface met the aluminum tone of the lower surface, and this nearly invisible blemish was enough to alter the wing's aerodynamics. With this interface removed, performance returned to normal. This difficulty was well-timed, so to speak, as when the SBD-2s were arriving in fleet service, the paint scheme of the interwar Navy's aircraft, which often featured highly conspicuous squadron markings and other bright colors, was replaced by an overall sea-gray camouflage scheme with only white identity numbers in the national insignia, consisting at this time of a white star set in a dark blue circle with a red meatball superimposed on the center of the star. In June 1940, orders were placed for the further development of the aircraft, the SBD-3. 187 SBD-3s were ordered from Douglas. This was the model of the dive bomber that would fight the early battles against the Imperial Japanese Navy.
Though the new Mark of the Dauntless was more capable, it was still considered to be a stopgap, and the Navy was looking to an altogether new dive bomber, the Curtis SB-2C, as a dive bomber to equip its expanding carrier fleet. This is a much larger and more powerful aircraft, but this new plane was still in an early stage of development. At the time this order was placed, France was collapsing, and with the likelihood of war increasing both in Europe and in the Far East, the Navy could not afford to wait. The initial order for 187 was followed later in the year for another for another 500 more. The first SBD-3 was delivered on March 18, 1941. This new mark would incorporate many improvements shown to be desirable in the light of the experience of the European war. These included armored protection for the crew, a bulletproof windscreen, and full bladder-type self-sealing fuel tanks. In addition to these passive defenses, firepower was increased by adding a second 30 caliber to the rear gunner's armament. A new mark of the R-1820 engine, the Dash 52, was installed, and the extra power it gave proved enough that the removal of the second 50 caliber in the nose was no longer considered necessary. This increased defensive firepower still came at the cost, however, and the performance remained relatively degraded with the full weapons load. To compensate, weight was removed elsewhere in the plane, chiefly in the form of thinner skinning material and the deletion of flotation gear for use in water landings. In terms of external appearance, there was virtually no difference between the Dash 3 and the early models, except that the propeller spinner was often deleted. Navy pilots that would fly a new bomber received on average 300 hours of flying time before joining a carrier air group. With the exception of the very early parts of the war, when American flyers were going up against the skilled Japanese veterans of the China War, this was just about double the average training hours of their counterparts in the Japanese Navy flying the Vow. Flight hours were divided between a number of subject areas, including night and instrument flying, navigation, aerial tactics, and specific attack types such as aerial gunnery, glide bombing, and anti-submarine attack, as well as dive bombing. A particularly hazardous and exhilarating portion of the training involved night diving attacks. Ground school subjects included technical instruction on all aspects of the aircraft, its instrumentation, communications gear, and radar equipment as this became available. Candidates were also drilled in all aspects of operational and tactical procedures such as fighter direction and anti-submarine warfare, practical meteorology, communications procedure, aircraft and ship recognition, and lecture hall studies of gunnery, ammunition types, and torpedo and bombing methods. U.S. Navy believed in the dive bombing attack. This confidence was communicated to the trainee pilots, put this into practice, and refined it into a deadly method of sinking enemy ships. Flight instructor Pensacola went to watch the dive bombing practice at the ranges outside of Norfolk, Virginia, in 1940. He described the results as such, quote, Most of the pilots, considering that the bombs were released when the target was more than a quarter mile below, achieved considerable accuracy. If they ever came down out of the sun lane at any vulnerable target, though it be protected by gunfire, most of them would have made direct hits. These men would get their chance to prove him right soon enough. A carrier air group of the U.S. Navy typically consisted of a mixture of the four tactical types of carrier planes then in service. These were fighters, torpedo bombers, scouts, and dive bombers. The Dauntless would serve in the latter two roles, a circumstance that would lead to the separate scouting squadrons, which were designated by VS, eventually disappearing and being merged into the dive bomber squadrons, which were designated VB. These Dahmer squadrons afterwards would serve both roles. Dauntless squadrons, whether VS or VB, had a nominal establishment of 18 planes, a handy number suitable for splitting into pairs of aircraft for scouting missions, or formations based on three plane sections for bombing missions. So now let's take a look at some examples of the typical missions that the SBD was built to carry out. For the scouting mission, the SBD would carry a single 500 pound or 227 kilogram bomb and a load of fuel sufficient to achieve a range of 1,300 miles, or about 2,100 kilometers. Standard scouting procedure in the first half of the war involved pairs of SBDs, each of which was assigned a triangular search sector. Generally, 10 such sectors would be assigned, each designated by a letter between A and T. Starting at the carrier, at the apex of the triangle, the scouts would fly an outbound leg between 150 and 250 miles, or about 240 or 320 kilometers in length. They would then turn 90 degrees and fly a cross leg about 20 or 50 miles between 32 and 65 kilometers. Here they would remain for some time before flying the final leg back to the carrier. Since the carrier would have moved while the planes were away, since the carrier would have moved while the planes were away, they returned to a predetermined rendezvous point known as the point option that had been worked out before launch. Sometimes combat or other circumstances would result in the carrier being elsewhere when the time came. In this case, the returning aircraft would rely on a radio homing beacon aboard the carrier, which broadcast a single letter in Morse code. 
This letter would be chosen so that by its relation to the letters assigned to the search sectors, the pilots could determine the direction in which the carrier could be found. This beacon, however, was only useful out to a range of about 35 miles or 55 kilometers. Searches were carried out at relatively low altitude, typically between 1 and 2,000 feet or 300 and 600 meters, though this was often changed due to weather and visibility conditions. This low altitude approach was used for two reasons. First, to optimize fuel economy, and second, to assist in the correct identification of any ships that would be spotted. Ship identification from altitude turned out to be a much more difficult task than had been anticipated. In instances of destroyers or even smaller craft being reported as battleships, or merchant and auxiliary ships reported as combat vessels, are very commonplace in the records of the Pacific War. If an enemy ship or a group of ships was sighted, a contact report would be sent out by the rear seat man in the aircraft. These messages were sent in Morse code, and in theory they would be encrypted, but this is often not the case in practice. Ideally, a clear, concise report would be sent back to the fleet, with a number and type of vessel sighted, their distance and bearing from the friendly fleet, and estimated course and speed. The pair of scout planes would then maintain contact with the enemy force and send a series of updated reports for as long as their fuel situation or enemy response allowed. If possible, other scouts would usually join the original pair to keep the enemy under continuous supervision. Though the SPDs carried bombs on these missions, their primary job was to ensure that the strike forces from the carrier could find the enemy, and this meant shadowing the enemy rather than attacking themselves. Nonetheless, SPDs and scouting pairs would sometimes carry out attacks on enemy targets, especially in the early months of the war, when the very limited radar capability of the Japanese ships meant that the scouts could often approach undetected. With only a 500-pound bomb, these could do little damage against heavily armored ships. Nevertheless, successful strikes by scouting SPDs were not unusual. They could be very deadly to submarines and smaller surface craft, and certainly a 500-pounder hitting a larger and more heavily protected warship wasn't going to do it any good. But in general, the damage a pair of light-armed SPDs could do was limited. They were much more valuable as guides for the full-scale attack force, and attacks by scouting pairs before the strike force was home to the target were heavily discouraged. In a carrier battle, the quality of the scouting and the scouting reports were a variable of crucial importance, and in some cases entire battles hung on the information, or lack of information, that was transmitted by the scout plane crews. As an aside, the quality of U.S. Navy scouting was consistently inferior to that of the Japanese throughout the war. The Japanese took a different approach to naval reconnaissance, and did not use carrier-borne scout aircraft. Instead, this mission was carried out by catapult-launched float planes flown off of cruisers. This is the reason why the Imperial Japanese Navy included such vessels as the Tone-class scout cruisers, which carried large numbers of float planes. These relatively short-range tactical scouts were supplemented in a strategic role by large, multi-engine flying boats for long-range patrols. Japanese tactical doctrine also placed a greater emphasis on the scout mission, and this was reflected in the fact that they very often located the American forces first, and at a longer range. This practice also left their carrier air group entirely dedicated to fighter and attack types. Later in the war, the Japanese would use an excellent carrier-borne scout bomber, the D-4Y-1C, known to the Allies as the Judy, fast aircraft with a range upwards of 2,400 miles, or nearly 4,000 kilometers. The Japanese would retain this scouting advantage well into the war, as though the American technique and material would improve, they would abandon the separate scouting mission altogether in 1944, and rely on the bomber pilots to do the fleet's recon as a secondary function. Once a contact report was received and confirmed, an attack force would be assembled from among the carrier planes. The exact mix of fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo bombers to be sent against the enemy, as well as those which would be retained for fleet defense or for a backup strike, would have to be determined. Once launched, the dive bombers assigned to the strike would be vectored to a specific portion of the nearby airspace to form themselves into combat formation. SVDs flying in a dive bombing role carried a 1,000 pound or 455 kilogram bomb on the center line bombing crutch, and usually a pair of lighter 100 pound weapons under the wings. The dive bombers formed up into sections of three planes each to form a relatively strong concentration of defensive firepower. The normal SBD attack force would consist of 12 aircraft arranged in four three ship elements divided into pairs of elements to form two groups of six. A maximum effort was rare, and would see 18 planes sent, or three such groups of six. The dive bombers would normally fly in close formation to be able to cover one another with their defensive weapons, despite the fact that this anti-fighter formation would present a relatively compact target to Japanese anti-aircraft artillery. This type formation would usually be held for as long as possible, in many cases right up to the final attack phase. 
Once the aircraft had formed up, they would climb slowly to cruising altitude. This could be as high as 18,000 feet or about 5,500 meters, but it was usually between 14 and 16,000 feet, 4,300 and 5,000 meters. This would keep them above most anti-aircraft fire, but would still allow the crews to fly without oxygen. As the formation neared the enemy ships, however, they would still encounter long-range director-controlled AAA such as the Japanese 5-inch, 40 caliber gun, 127mm weapon, which could reach out to aircraft at these altitudes for a considerable distance. Bombers would remain in their anti-fighter formation as long as possible. In these, the element leaders flew with two wingmen slightly behind and on either side in a V formation. These elements would follow, either singly or in pairs, in a line of stern formation separated by a distance of about 300 yards. Each element would follow somewhat lower than the one before it, so as to allow for rapid maneuver without blocking the path or the view of the others. This step-down formation also allowed the individual bombers to peel off into their approach dives without impeding the forward progress of the others. Once visual contact was made with the enemy ships, formation leaders would begin their approach. Normally, the enemy would be sighted at a range between 25 and 40 miles, and the approach would be calculated to take maximum advantage of clouds, sun, and other factors and to achieve the maximum degree of surprise. As the range shortened, the anti-fighter formations would begin to loosen up, and the group as a whole slowly begin descending, increasing their speed and complicating the problem of gunnery or interception. The goal of the formation leader during the phase of the approach dive would be to position the aircraft so that all pilots could have a clear view of the target as the formation dropped towards 10,000 feet. Unless fighter opposition was present, formations would spread out further and drift into a line of stern formation, with much larger separations between individual aircraft and elements of aircraft. This would present a much more dispersed and difficult target for the NI aircraft as they came in. For most of the war, these tactics kept the dive bombers, who were relatively free to maneuver until the moment of entering their final dive, almost immune to anti-aircraft fire. Not only were they much more difficult to hit than level bombers, which must of necessity maintain a predictable flight path over their target, but in the dive itself the SBDs came in at a speed which was much too fast for the Japanese fuses and prediction gear to be effective. Thus, even though a diving SBD presented an almost no deflection shot to an anti-aircraft gunner, only a direct hit could harm the aircraft, and even then not necessarily. The Japanese dive bombers shared in this relative immunity at first, but eventually lost it as efficient fire control radars and, above all, the proximity fuse came into common use in Allied shipboard AAA. As attack position was reached, the flight leader would generally signal his intention to begin the final dive by kicking his rudder. He would then wing over and start down, followed in succession by the rest of the formation. Each pilot in turn would chop the throttle, adjust the propeller pitch, and bring the nose up into a stalling position, and then depart the formation and head down towards the target. Since the aircraft peeled off in succession, each would come at the target from a different direction, with the bombers converging in sequence as they plummeted towards the enemy. As he went down, the pilot opened the dive brakes, and from this point on, the dive bombing attack was an entirely individual operation, with success or failure hinging entirely on the skill of the pilot. The optimal angle for the dive was just over 70 degrees. Greater accuracy could be expected from a vertical dive in theory, the great majority of American dive bombing attacks were carried out at angles between 70 and 75 degrees. Shallower angles than this meant a longer exposure to AAA, more difficult bomb aiming, and a lesser impact velocity, which is a vital consideration if the attack was being made against heavily armored targets. The priority target for the dive bombers was always the enemy's aircraft carrier. There were two main reasons for this. First, the carriers were huge wooden deck ships with large, uncompartmented hangar spaces full of aircraft weapons and fuel directly below the flight deck. This made them terribly vulnerable to bombs punching in from above, even relatively light ones, exploding among the highly flammable materials on the hangar deck. Second, the carriers and their air groups usually represented the greatest threat in the Japanese arsenal. These were eliminated. An American task force, which was usually protected by its own battleships and other heavy service units, had little to fear from the rest of the enemy fleet. This went double if the American carriers remained operational. The diving aircraft would inevitably fly through intense close-range anti-aircraft fire. The main Japanese close-in weapon was the 25mm 60 caliber gun, mounted in single, double, and triple installations. These were optical, director-controlled weapons firing a 250-gram shell at a rate of 220 rounds per minute. These could engage the SVD at close range all the way down its dive, which at a 70 degree dive angle gave an average exposure to fire of about 12 seconds. Dozens of these guns would be in action at once, not only on the target ship, but on the other ships in the area, 
with a battleship carrying as many as 100 and cruisers something like 40 or more. The difficulty of the target presented by the plunging bombers can be gauged by the general ineffectiveness of this tremendous volume of fire against them, a difficulty which would be added to by the often radical maneuvers being carried out by the Japanese ships, which themselves would be moving at flank speed. The Japanese carriers, in particular, threw themselves into full helm circles at maximum speed in the face of these diving attacks, throwing off their own fire but making the giant ships into surprisingly elusive targets. In the face of these maneuvers, an attack made diving across the target's beam offered surer aim due to the comparative lack of deflection, while an attack made along the fore and aft center line of the ship offered a larger relative target and lesser exposure to defensive fire. On the way in, the pilot would arm his bomb. This involved the removal of a pair of wires which prevented the small spinner on the bomb's nose from rotating in the airstream and thus arming the bomb's fuse. In U.S. Navy procedure, the rear seat man was required to remind the pilot of this, a job which probably required a lot of tact in the highly stressful circumstances. Bomb armed, the pilot would generally select a point to aim at off the target and allow the wind to drift his aircraft to this point, where his bomb would meet the oncoming ship. In the final phase of the descent, the pilot would make his final aim with the aid of the three-power telescopic sight. The use of this sight was complicated early in the war by the tendency of the optics to fog up during the dive. This defect was corrected with special coatings and finally eliminated altogether by the replacement of this sight with the Mark 8 reflector model in 1943. The sight was greatly superior to the telescopic model. The optimum altitude for bomb release depended on the type of bomb carried. General purpose bombs, which were meant to impact on the ship's deck and wreck AAA emplacements and other softer targets, were used alongside semi-armor piercing bombs to cause havoc on the deck and suppress the defenses, often to facilitate attacks by torpedo planes. These did not need a high terminal velocity, and could be released from a greater variety of altitudes. Armor-piercing bombs did need this great speed and momentum to punch through successive armored decks, and as a result were often released at a relatively high altitude. Generally bombs were released from around 2,500 feet, or about 750 meters. Lower releases were of course desirable for hitting small, fast-moving targets, but brought with it a much greater exposure to AAA, especially during the vulnerable pull-out and withdrawal phase. In general, a larger target was attacked from a higher altitude, although instances of attacks pressed down to the very limit are not uncommon, especially early on. Upon release, the bomb would fall away from the plane with a regular gravitational acceleration and would thus drop relative to the aircraft's flight path at release. As a result, just before the release, the pilot would lift the nose of the SBD to compensate for this falling off effect. This angle between the dive and the release point was called the bombing angle, and it increased with the shallowness of the dive. Judgment of this bombing angle was one of the trickier parts of the pilot's mission. At the precise moment his aircraft nose rotated through the bombing angle, the pilot would yank the bomb release lever and drop the weapon. An early difficulty encountered was the tendency of pilots to simultaneously move the control stick with their right hand while actuating the bomb release with the left. This sudden jerky control motion would gravely affect accuracy. This was corrected by substituting an electric button on the control stick to work the release gear, with the existing lever kept as a backup. In practice, most SPD pilots would operate both, the button first and the lever after. In this case, the accuracy difficulty did not arise as the lever was pulled after the bomb had usually already left the aircraft. Once the bomb was gone, the mission of the pilot was to get out of the target zone and survive. The dive brakes would be closed, the stick pulled up, and the throttle punched open. This was the most vulnerable portion of the mission, where the SPDs were exposed to fire from all sides as well as attacks by Japanese fighters. Every measure would be taken to put the bomber into clean aerodynamic trim and maximize velocity to get clear of the danger area. Each aircraft would find its own way out over and among the ships of the enemy fleet, flying in evasive of course with constantly changing speed, height, and bearing, confuse enemy aim. This period of intense activity usually left the pilot with little opportunity to observe the effects of his bomb run. Often the rear seat man would also be unable to observe the results of the attack and it was common for success or failure to be unknown until after the plane's gun camera footage could be developed and evaluated. This was one of the many, many factors that led to the general unreliability of claims and counterclaims made by pilots and aircrew in the first part of the Pacific War. Once more or less clear of the danger, the leading aircraft would reduce speed and head towards the prearranged rendezvous area, where the aircraft would reform themselves into defensive formation for the return flight. Once it was feasible, the formation would climb back to cruising altitude and head for the point option, at which they could expect to find the carrier. Stragglers and damaged aircraft were husbanded as well as possible without jeopardizing the entire group, and the return flight was often as much of a nail-biter as any other part of the mission. Often strikes were mounted at maximum range, 
and fuel supply was a constant source of anxiety. Every pilot worried that undetected battle damage may have nicked a fuel line, putting down in the vast Pacific, where death by starvation and exposure awaited those who survived the landing, is an ever-present nightmare, as well as the prospect of rescue by the Japanese, who were not known for their humane treatment of prisoners. As the war went on, Americans gradually built up a very efficient air-sea rescue service using flying boats and float planes working in conjunction with submarines. This would reduce this hazard, but never fully eliminate it. Perhaps more daunting still was the prospect of returning to the carrier after dark, especially in a damaged aircraft with a possibly wounded pilot. In many instances, these night landings had to be hazarded due to necessity, and in these many pilots were forced to make water landings near the friendly fleet or crash their aircraft into the carrier's decks. Stragglers, coming home sometime after the rest of the formation, were particularly exposed to the danger of being forced to ditch, even in daylight, as they would often arrive as the next wave of attack planes was being launched. In an all-out carrier duel, no delay could be made for them, and they would often find themselves with no fuel and no clear decks to land on. Following the retrieval of the dive bomber groups, they would make their reports and be debriefed. More often than not, they would then immediately be sent on another strike as soon as their aircraft could be readied. Even if they were allowed a rest period, in a carrier battle, this would often coincide with the enemy's counterstroke arriving over their own carrier. This would mean their theoretical downtime would be spent aboard a desperately maneuvering target with hundreds of guns blazing away, surrounded by the chaos and smoke and flames of near misses and possibly of direct hits. When war came to the Americans in Hawaii, two squadrons of Marine Air Group 21 were stationed at Awa Field. These were VMSB 231, flying seven Vought Vindicators, and VMSB 232, equipped with 19 SBD 1s and a trio of SBD 2s. Three carriers of the Pacific Fleet each had two squadrons of Dauntlesses aboard. These were VS-6 and VB-2, flying SBD-2s from the Lexington, VS-6 and VB-6 aboard the Enterprise, and VS-3 and VB-3 embarked aboard the Saratoga. Yorktown, carrying VS-5 and VB-5, was on the Atlantic coast at the time of Pearl Harbor. She was immediately sent to the Panama Canal Zone to make transit and join the Pacific Fleet. This left Ranger and Wasp, both flying Vindicators, in the Atlantic, while the Hornet was still in the process of fitting out, and flew biplane SBC-4 Heildivers in her dive bomber complement. One of the first American aircraft to see action in the Pacific War was a Dauntless from the Enterprise's scouting squadron. This carrier was about 250 miles west of Awa Field on its way back from a mission ferrying Marine F-4F Wildcat fighters to the garrison of Wake Island. These scouting SBDs had guided the Marine aviators to their new field just days before. Now, on the eve of the Japanese attack, the war warning had gone out to the Navy ships, and the SBDs of Scouting 6, fully armed with defensive weapons and 500-pound bombs, were launched to search for suspected Japanese forces in the area. As per normal practice, they were sent to scour the sea in pairs in the direction of the islands. The mission started out placidly enough. However, the Japanese attack arrived just as they were preparing to return, and the planes of Scouting 6 ran right into it. One of these was flown by Lieutenant Commander Howard Young, his pilot and his wingman, Ensign Perry L. Tief, spotted a squadron-sized formation of aircraft over the Marine Field of Dewa, which lay to the west of Pearl Harbor. One of the unknown planes broke away from the formation and approached the Americans, getting on the tail of Tief's aircraft. He assumed that this was a local U.S. Army pilot joking around, until Japanese 7.7mm machine gun rounds began slamming into his SBD. Almost simultaneously, anti-aircraft fire erupted all throughout the area. All of a sudden, war had intruded into the beautiful Hawaiian skies. Young and Tief stuck together and attempted to evade repeated firing passes by the enemy aircraft, an A6M20 carrier fighter. Tief's rear seat man E.P. Jenks kept the fighter at bay with his machine guns, and eventually the Japanese pilot left to seek other prey. The two aircraft managed to avoid further enemy attention and then braved friendly anti-aircraft fire to put down on Ford Island that fateful morning. Another Enterprise Dauntless, piloted by Ensign Manuel Gonzalez, was not so lucky. His SVD was bounced and shot down by Japanese D-3A dive bombers and crashed into the sea. Neither he nor his rear seat man, Leonard Kozelik, were ever found. Four more Dauntlesses from Enterprise's Scouting 6, flying in pairs near Hawaii, were attacked by Japanese aircraft and lost. Another pair was shot up by American anti-aircraft gunners as they passed Fort Waver. One of these was forced to ditch offshore while another brought his shredded plane in safely to land at the devastated Hickam Field. 51 Japanese dive bombers under Lieutenant Commander Kakuichi Takahashi came in in the first attack wave. One of their primary targets was the Marine base. The Marine SBDs of Marine Air Group 1 were caught by surprise and hit on the ground. 
17 of them were demolished in the first attack, and the remaining five were damaged. Six Dauntlesses were shot down in the Pearl Harbor raids, five by the enemy and one by the Americans. Eight crewmen, three pilots, and five backseaters have been killed and three wounded. Thirteen SBDs remain in the area, ten of which were at Fort Island. With these, an impromptu search was mounted, but nothing was spotted as by this time the Japanese had withdrawn towards the northwest. The SBDs were, however, able to claim their first victory in this opening action. A string of Japanese submarines was stationed in ambush near the islands, and one of these, the I-70, was spotted by an SBD of EB-6 and rendered incapable of diving by a near miss from the dive bomber's 500-pound bomb. A pilot of VS-6 would later find the stricken submarine running on the surface about 180 miles or about 300 kilometers north of Oahu and send her to the bottom. This was the first sub lost to enemy air attack by the Japanese. Things continued badly for the U.S. Navy carrier fleet in January when the Saratoga was torpedoed by the submarine I-16 off of Johnston Island to the south of Hawaii on the 11th. She sailed home for repair, leaving her air group in Hawaii. Not long after, her sisters Yorktown and Enterprise were striking targets in the Gilbert and Marshall Islands in retaliatory raids. VS-6 and VB-6 took part in these as well. These left the decks at 0443 hours on February 1st for the first of two attacks on that day. The aforementioned Howard Young was back in action, leading this force with included 37 SBDs from the Enterprise against installations on Kwajalein, Roy, and Torora Islands. The attack force climbed to 14,000 feet, or about 4,300 meters, and formed into step-down echelons of three ship Vs and headed west towards the Japanese Howled Islands. The strike was timed to hit just before 0700 in hopes of catching the Japanese still waking, but visibility was such that the Americans were compelled to fly a wide arc around the area in order to identify their targets. This lost them the element of surprise, and the Navy flyers would go in against a prepared and alerted defense with fighters scrambling off the airstrip to intercept. VS-6 went in first, six planes at a time, Drop their bombs on the airstrip from an altitude of about 1,000 feet, blasting the installations, cratering the runways, and putting a bomb square into a munitions dump, setting off a massive explosion. This was achieved in the first pass and without the use of their 500-pounders. Pilots of VS-6 wreaked this havoc with the 100-pound underwing weapons alone. A second pass was made, with the Dauntlesses shooting up the field with their machine guns, claiming seven aircraft destroyed on the ground and three more in the air. This result was more spectacular than substantial, and in fact, the flyers of VS-6 judged none of the targets of the field worthy of expending their main bombs on, and departed the target area still carrying them. The dive bomber's comparative immunity to ground fire held for the most part, but the lead aircraft, piloted by Lieutenant Commander Hal Hopping, drew almost all the Japanese fire and was unable to pull out of its dive. The aircraft, Hopping, and his backseater Harold Thomas, smashed into the Pacific and sank like a stone. But not before earning the distinction of planting the first American bombs on the territory of the Japanese Empire. Three more SBDs were brought down, one by a Japanese A-5M fighter and the other two falling to concentrated AAA. This was a comparatively heavy cost for the meager results achieved. Meanwhile, American planes scouting Kwajalein Anchorage found warships and transports of the Japanese Navy in the harbor. These were what the Dauntlesses were saving their bombs for, and VB-6 along with the remainder of VS-6 were ordered into the area to hit them. VB-6, led by Commander W.R. Hollingsworth, went after the vessel's first and full-on 70-degree diving attacks then made three direct hits on the shipping there. Racing back to the carrier to rearm and refuel for a follow-up strike, the dive bombers were redirected to Tarora, where Navy fighters had spotted a force of 40 twin-engine bombers ranged up on the field. Hollingsworth set off for the field in the first wave consisting of nine SBDs, seven from BB-6 and two from VS-6. Not long after, a second wave followed under Lieutenant Richard Best with another nine dive bombers. The first wave hit the field and encountered little opposition. The second wave ran into heavy fighter opposition and alerted flak. Nevertheless, they pressed the attack home, with Lieutenant Clarence Dickinson hitting a nearby 10,000-ton seaplane tender of the Iwata class. Fierce air-to-air -air skirmishes marked the withdrawal phase as the Dauntlesses sought to escape from the Karg area. The fighters that intercepted the Navy planes were Mitsubishi A-5Ms, sometimes known by its allied reporting name as the Claude. This was a nimble single-seater aircraft, the fixed-gear, open-cockpit predecessor of the A-6M carrier fighter. One of the SBDs, flown by Bombing 6 Executive Officer, Richard Best, became embroiled with a pair of these Japanese fighters. Though these shot holes in the tail assembly of his bomber, Best was able to outfly the defenders and escape. The last in line, piloted by Ensign Jack Darity, was not so lucky, and he was brought down. This is the fifth and last of the Enterprise's Dauntless that were lost in this raid. In addition to the short side damage the Japanese strikes had, in conjunction with the torpedo bombers, Sank a naval auxiliary and damaged the light cruiser Katori, the minelander Tokiwa, 
as well as four more auxiliary and transport ships. Meanwhile, the Japanese had struck at the carrier with five Mitsubishi G4M twin-engine bombers, scoring no less than 15 near misses on the ship. One of these Japanese planes, damaged by the fighters of the Defensive Air Patrol, went in for a suicide dive. This move, which was to become disconcertingly common in the no-quarter fighting that characterized the Pacific War, was countered by a full helm evasive turn that forced the bomber to steepen its dive even more to follow. One of the carrier's flight deck crew, aviation machinist second class Bruno Giotto, jumped into the rear gunner's seat of one of the SPDs parked on deck and engaged the incoming death missile in its terminal dive. As the flaming bomber smashed into the deck and bounced off, its right-hand wingtip sliced Giotto's plane clean in half and pushed the part containing the rear cockpit into a hanging position off the port edge of the flight deck. From here, the enraged mechanic continued to empty the bisected dive bomber's twin 30 calibers into the wreckage of the Japanese bomber as it floated away. While the Enterprise was hitting the Japanese here, the Yorktown undertook raids on the islands of Makin, Mili, and Jalut. 37 Dauntlesses from VB-5 and VB-6 attacked Japanese installations here under the command of Lieutenant Commander William Birch. The Navy planes found little worth attacking here, and VB-5 bombed freshwater storage tanks at Jalut in lieu of anything more important. While aircraft of Scouting 5 destroyed a pair of flying boats moored in the harbor at Mackin. These raids cost the Yorktown 6 aircraft a very heavy toll for the slim results achieved. The cost was almost much higher, as the returning Dauntlesses reached the carrier with very little fuel remaining, some of them landing with hardly two gallons left in their almost empty fuel tanks. At the end of January, Lexington was sent from Pearl to the Panama Canal Zone to escort troop convoys transiting the canal. In mid-February, she was sent to strike Rabaul, a major Japanese fleet base on the island of New Britain. However, American Task Force, Task Force 11, was located and attacked by Japanese aircraft while still well out of striking range of the target, and the mission was called off. This is an example of the utility of the advantage the Japanese enjoyed in scouting. By locating the approaching fleet first and furthest away, they were able to put the Americans on the defensive. These ships were due into the Coral Sea, and from there rendezvoused with the Yorktown in the area of the New Hebrides Island Group in early March. In the meantime, the American outpost at Wake Island had fallen to the Japanese. The Enterprise sailed from Pearl on the 14th of February to strike the Japanese holding the former Marine installations. Ten days later, at 0500 hours, the strike group took off from her decks with included 27 SBDs. On this first strike, they met little opposition and lost only one aircraft. Two hours later, another raid set out. This larger strike included the full complement of both SBD squadrons on board, 18 apiece. VS-6 struck an oil storage facility with dives from 18,000 feet and claimed the destruction of several of the storage tanks for no loss to themselves. At the same time, VB-6 hit small naval craft off the pier on Peel Island. One of these pilots, Ensign Delbert Halsey, attacked and pursued one of the Japanese Navy's large Kawanishi four-engine long-range flying boats, but was unable to overtake the big plane and was forced to break off the chase. The Enterprise task group pressed westwards and launched its next attack against Marcus Island. The SBDs of VS-6 took off and formed up in the pre-dawn darkness of March 4th and approached the island above a heavy layer of cloud covering the sea at 1,200 to 2,400 meters. At 0630, the dive bombers found Marcus through a break in the clouds. Strong tailwind had brought the Americans to the target more quickly than anticipated, and the ground was still shrouded in darkness. As a result, this attack was performed with the aid of moonlight and flares. Bombers made their attacks from 16,000 feet or about 4,800 meters. They hit oil tanks and a radio station. Flak was heavier here than the Navy pilots had previously encountered. Several planes were hit, although only one, flown by Lieutenant Dale Hilton, was brought down. His pilot managed a successful water landing. He and his backseater, Jack Lemming, were captured and faced the bleak prospects of an American POW in Japanese hands. Yorktown, meanwhile, sallied out to make similar raids on Anawetok and the Carolines. Like the Lexington strike on Rabaul, this was aborted, and the two carriers were sent to rendezvous in the area of the New Hebrides. The two carrier task forces centered on them, task forces 11 and 17, were concentrated near New Guinea to cover the passage of Allied transports carrying an American division from Brisbane to Numea. On the 10th of March, they took part in attacks on the Japanese landing forces coming ashore on Papua. This was the first two-carrier operation mounted by the U.S. Navy, who sent out an attack force totaling 104 aircraft. All four SBD squadrons, for a total of 79 dive bombers, participated in these raids. These were launched from a point not far off the southern coast, flew across the island from the Gulf of Papua, over the Owen Stanley Mountains, to attack Lae and Salamoa. A large concentration of Japanese shipping lay in the area, and the SBDs in conjunction with the TDB dive bombers began attacks on these ships around 0930. The armed merchant cruiser Congo Maru was sunk along with the transport Yokohama Maru. Another transport, 
Tenru Maru, was hit fatally and beached by its skipper before it had a chance to sink. Damage was done to the cruiser Yubari, the mine lighter Sigaru, and the destroyers Asanagi and Yanagi, another transport, and two auxiliary vessels. This was achieved at the cost of one SBD lost from Scouting 2, part of the Lectington's air group. For most of the month of April, the Hornet and Enterprise sailed as part of a task force undertaking the dual little raid to Tokyo. Embarked aboard was VB-3 from the stateside Saratoga's air group, while her own VB-6 remained behind on shore, training new pilots with upgraded marks of the plane. On the 18th, these planes found a line of Japanese patrol vessels in the carrier's path and sent two to the bottom while damaging another pair. There is no way of knowing if they had signaled the presence of American carrier planes in the area, however, and this circumstance led to the early launch of the B-25s of Doolittle's raiding squadron from the Hornet. By May, then, the stage was set for the first major carrier battle of the war. Two Japanese naval spearheads were proceeding into the area of the Solomon Sea. One force was heading for a landing at Tulagi Island in nearby Guadalcanal, where they would build an airstrip that would shortly become a focus of one of the where they would build an airstrip that would shortly become the focus of some of the most brutal fighting of the entire war. A second force, somewhat to the south, was headed for the eastern shore of New Guinea. This operation, codenamed Mo by the Japanese, involved a landing of an invasion force at Port Moresby to support their existing beachheads at Lae and Salamoa. This task force, including 12 transports and escorting warships, left for ball on the 4th and set course to Louisiades, eventually to turn west into the Coral Sea. The activity of the American carriers in the area mentioned before caused this convoy to turn back and await the outcome of the coming actions. This convoy was covered by a supporting squadron consisting of the light carrier Shoho, four heavy cruisers, and a destroyer. Also in the area, somewhat to the north, was a strong Japanese carrier force built around the large pair of Shokaku and Sukaku, two of the veterans of the Pearl Harbor raid. The Americans had broken into Japanese naval signals codes in the years before the wars and were aware of the approaching Japanese fleets. They were also beginning to receive inklings of a greater effort that was to be mounted soon in the Central Pacific. With strictly limited resources to meet these moves, Americans set in motion a concentration plan, bringing together Lexington's Task Force 11 and Yorktown's Task Force 17 in the area of the New Hebrides. These carrier groups would be joined by Task Force 44, consisting of two more heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, and two destroyers. This would have brought together an American fleet of six heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, and 11 destroyers in addition to the pair of flat tops. This concentration would have still left them inferior to the Japanese forces they would have to face off against, but even this plan was dashed by the discovery of the Tulagi invasion force. The discovery of this thrust induced Rear Admiral Jack Fletcher, commander of Task Force 17, to send the Yorktown out after these ships while the remainder of his force withdrew to fuel itself up in anticipation of a larger action to come. The Yorktown task group made its approach towards Launch Point under a heavy layer of clouds, which negated the Japanese scouting advantage. The planes left the deck at 0730 hours on the 4th, arrived over the anchorage at Tulagi at 0920. They caught the enemy completely by surprise. A total of 28 SBD-2s from VS-5 and VB-5, all armed with heavy 1,000-pound bombs, found the waters off the island full of unloading transports, protected only by the mine layer Okinoshima, a pair of destroyers, and a few minesweepers. They descended from cruising altitude to 10,000 feet, about 3,000 meters, approached dive, then kicked over into 70-degree attack dives. The dive bombers released their bombs relatively high against these sluggish targets at about 800 meters. The telescopic sights of the SBDs fogged up badly during these attacks, and the Americans were unable to accurately gauge the results of their attacks. VS-5 claimed four direct hits, while VB-5's crews claimed another pair. The effect of the fogged up sights contributed to the relatively slender results of this large surprise attack. The destroyer Kikazuki, which took a bomb in her starboard engine room, was crippled and had to be beached, and three minesweepers that were sunk were the only enemy vessels lost. Heavy damage was also inflicted on the mine layer in the transport Azuma San Maru, while one of the VB-5 pilots also claimed a floatplane fighter shot down. A second strike by the Yorktown's planes arrived over the same target at 12.10 hours, this time with 27 Dauntlesses. Targets were even sparser this time, as the majority of the Japanese vessels had departed the area. The dive bombers sank another pair of patrol vessels and scored a direct hit on the transport Tama Maru. The ship would be sunk two days later as a result of this damage. Two hits were also scored on a destroyer, the Izuki, which was set on fire with the loss of her captain and nine other crewmen. The fires were eventually brought under control, however, and this ship survived. The SBDs also claimed the destruction of four more seaplanes by strafing. No American planes were lost in this raid. The third strike followed at 1510 hours, damaging another transport, the Koei Miru. Following this raid, the ships of TF-17 withdrew to a new rendezvous with the Lexington's group. 
Having joined up, the two carriers topped up with fuel and began searching for the Port Moresby invasion force. To the north of the Americans lay the main Japanese carrier strike force, consisting of the pair of big carriers under Vice Admiral Takagi, escorted by a surface combat squadron of two heavy cruisers and six destroyers. This force was also searching, attempting to locate the ships responsible for the raids on Tulagi. At 0730 on the 5th, one of the cruiser's scout planes reported an American carrier and cruiser to the south of the Japanese squadron. Thinking that the prey had been found, Takagi launched a full-strength airstrike against them, hoping to crush the Americans before they knew he was in the area. The Japanese flyers did find the American ships, but these had been misidentified by the scout plane crew. In fact, ships were the fleet oiler Neosho and the destroyer Sims, part of the American fleet train. These two luckless ships were overwhelmed and sent to the bottom, but Takagi had blown his chance to profit by his reconnaissance advantage, and missed his chance of getting in the first shot against the American carriers. In the meantime, the Americans had found the Shoho squadron covering the invasion convoy, and at 0826 hours, the first attack wave left the decks of the Lexington, followed an hour later by an air group from the Yorktown. And so the first carrier-to-carrier -carrier action of the Pacific War began. American strike crossed the Louisiades at 15,000 feet, or about 4,600 meters, above a deck of heavy clouds. At 0950, they left the weather behind and found the Japanese carrier sailing under bright, sunlit skies. The attack was again unexpected and was carried out under virtually ideal conditions. Heavy barrage of flak was sent out from the escorting cruisers, but aerial opposition was almost nil. A total of 35 SBDs from VS-2 and VB-2 approached the Japanese cautiously, waiting to coordinate their dives with the attacks of the torpedo squadrons also coming in. Heavy flak was encountered as the dive bombers made their approach, but no aircraft were hit. As the SBD squadrons reached position for their final dives, the Shoho threw herself into a violent turn to port in an attempt to throw off their aim by putting them athwart the wind. Defending fighters also engaged just as the bombers headed down. One SBD's rear gunner, John Liska, blasted two of these with his twin 30s as his plane tipped its nose seaward. The pilot, an ensign Lepla, also claimed another which tried to follow the dive bomber down and overshot, putting itself right in front of the forward machine guns. This made three air-to-air -air kills in a single minute during the final attack dive, which was a remarkable achievement. Planes of VS-2 went in first, and the frantically maneuvering Japanese managed to avoid all of their bombs. No less than ten near misses were scored. Sluck did not hold, however, for though as Scouting 2's planes withdrew, Bombing 2 came in from another quarter. The carrier immediately initiated another evasive turn, but it didn't save her this time. The lead plane scored a direct hit on the flight deck, which threw up a huge pall of black smoke. Four more followed in quick succession as the rest of the squadron followed it down. Once the Dauntlesses were at low level, they ran into the Japanese fighters in a thick crossfire of flak of all carablers. The combined defenses knocked down another pair of Lexington SBDs, while a third, piloted by the aggressive Lieutenant A.J. Quigley of VB-5, was forced to ditch in the sea after exhausting his fuel in the course of an intense chase after a retreating Japanese carrier plane. The dive bomber crews claimed another pair of Japanese planes shot down in the fight out of the battle zone. One zero shot down by a rear gunner and another float plane gunned down by Ensign Lapla, making this the fourth enemy aircraft credited to his plane during this mission. The ordeal of the shattered Shoho, however, had just begun. Shortly after the Lexington planes departed, the strike from the Yorktown arrived, having no trouble finding the now fiercely burning Japanese carrier. Despite the fact that it was clearly out of commission, the dive bombers piled in on her, having at last found the kind of target they'd trained for. Another nine hits were scored on the hapless vessel, which was also struck by no less than seven torpedoes launched by the TBD devastators of the torpedo squadrons. The rest of the Japanese task force was almost unmolested by the carrier planes, the only exception being a dive on one of the heavy cruiser escorts by Ensign Tom Brown's aircraft. It chose this target only because the heavy pall of black smoke billowing from the carrier made an accurate dive impossible. This attack was unsuccessful, but such was the inaccuracy of Navy post-op reporting that the Ensign was awarded the Navy Cross in recognition of his single-handed sinking of this vessel. The Shoho was finished. Almost before the Navy planes were clear of the area, the burning vessel was abandoned. She sank very soon afterwards. In a way, this was very similar to the fate of the British carrier Hermes, blasted to pieces in a very similar way by Nagumo's carrier force during their raids on the Royal Navy base at Trincomalee earlier that spring. Like that massacre, it demonstrated the terrible vulnerability of aircraft carriers to air attack without fighters in the air to defend them. On the way out, watching the ship go down, the leader of VB-2, Lieutenant Commander Robert Dixon, sent a signal to the American fleet. It read, Scratch one flat top a phrase that has become part of the common historiography of the Pacific War. The smashing of this carrier, though not responsible for the turning back of the Port Moresby invasion force, as is often asserted in the same common historiography, marked the realization of the potential embodied in the SBD program 
and the Navy's interwar dive bombing program. Despite the flush of victory, Americans back at the carrier groups were uneasily aware that they had themselves been located by Japanese scouts who had yet to find the two big enemy carriers known to be in the area. Nevertheless, Fletcher decided to press further into the Coral Sea and go after the invasion convoy known to be somewhere in the vicinity. This was facilitated by the fact that the heavy weather continued to cover the Americans as they proceeded. Night fell with the two fleets barely 100 miles or 160 kilometers apart. As dawn broke on the 8th, both fleets launched renewed aerial searches. The Lexington sent out 18 of her SBDs to make scouting flights, 14 from scouting 2 and 4 from bombing 2. These left the ship at 0625 hours and spread out to cover a full 360 degree pattern to a range of 200 miles. This effort yielded results from one of scouting 2's planes, phoned by Lieutenant Joseph G. Smith, made contact with the enemy fleet. It was off to the northwest, and at 0820 he sent a signal reporting, quote, 2CV, 4CA, and many DD. The message was almost inaudible, but it was received, and preparations began aboard the American ships. Meanwhile, Takagi's scouts had found the Americans, and just after 0900 hours, both sides began launching their air groups against the other. The Lexington sent off 19 SBDs from VB2 along with three planes from VS2, all that remained aboard. These were joined by 24 Dauntlesses from the Yorktown, 7 from Scouting 5, and 17 from VB5. All of these were armed with 1,000-pound bombs, but the Lexington's planes were sent with incomplete loads of fuel. These formed up with the accompanying fighters and torpedo planes and set out to cover the 175 miles or 280 kilometers separating them from the Japanese. As per regular scouting protocol, the strike force was homed into the target by the contacting scouts, with radio updates on course and bearing provided by the contacting aircraft. However, operational friction began to dog the Americans. The Lexington's air group became separated in the clouds, and eventually the SBDs of the Lexington group lost the fighters and torpedo planes in the Merck. Searching for them below the clouds, they eventually became critically short of fuel due to incomplete fueling before launch. Almost the entire force was compelled to jettison their weapons and return to the carrier. This left it up to the Yorktown's planes. At 10.50 hours, they spotted the Japanese carriers, spaced about 13 kilometers apart and surrounded by screening vessels. The SBDs had arrived ahead of the torpedo planes, and in order to coordinate the attacks, the dive bombers were forced to hover out of range for almost half an hour. In this time, the Zuikaku managed to conceal herself beneath the low clouds. The delay also meant that surprise was lost, and the Japanese decks were soon covered with fighters launching themselves to intercept. Finally, the SBDs began their approach glide, coming down from 17,000 feet. The seven planes of Scouting 5 were the first to go in. As they opened their dive brakes and peeled away into their attack dives, they were hit by the oncoming fighters. All seven Dauntlesses were hit in the resulting melee, but only one was brought down. The telescopic sights of these aircraft once again fogged up in the dive, throwing off their aim. And VS-5 scored no hits whatsoever. The coordinated attack by torpedo planes was also stymied by a too distant release of their weapons. The 17 SBDs of Bombing 5 were left to go after the still bloodied Shokaku. They were caught out of position to go in on the previous wave, and had to circle around to get into proper attack position. The Zeros came after them too, but were kept at a distance by the gunners, and undeterred the SBDs followed each other down in sequence, plunging steeply down towards the big carrier. The Japanese blasted away at the bombers with everything they had, and pushed their ship's maneuverability to the limit. Remarkably, the huge ship dodged no less than 15 of the 1,000 pounders, but two struck home, one forward on the port and the other on the starboard side opposite the bridge. Both of these bombs punched through the flight deck and burst in the open hangar decks below, wrecking the ready aircraft and igniting fierce gasoline fires. These fires were spectacular, the Japanese damage control was effective, and they were brought under control. The Shokaku would still be able to land her returning strike planes, now themselves approaching the American task groups. However, she would be launching no fresh ones into the fight, and the Dauntlesses took another pair of losses on this raid. Not long after, the scattered aircraft of the separated Lexington group arrived on the scene to make their attacks. These did not go well, and the torpedo planes failed to make any hits. Only four of the SBDs that set out had found the ship, but these made their presence felt, landing a third hit on the starboard side aft and completing the destruction of the carrier's flight deck. This greatly limited the carrier's ability to land her planes, and 46 of them would have to land aboard the Zukaku instead. The big carrier was out of the fight, and she was attached to the north out of the battle area, and eventually back to Japan for repairs. This effort was not without heavy costs to the dive bombers, however, and three of the four Lexington SBDs that had attacked were brought down including the commander of her air group, whose SBD was shot down by fighters during the escape run out of the area. While they were away, the Japanese found their ship. These battles were fought by the still-intact cream of the Japanese Naval Air Force, 
and these highly skilled crews put two torpedoes into the Lexington, as well as a pair of direct bomb hits. Hers was a converted battlecruiser hull, and thus somewhat tougher than some of the other carriers in the Pacific, but the hits ignited severe fires inside the carrier that set off massive secondary explosions of fuel and ordnance. She was abandoned and eventually sank at 2,000 hours with the assistance of American destroyer torpedoes. She took 14 Dauntlesses to the bottom with her. Only five of her dive bombers, which had landed aboard the Yorktown, would survive the battle. The Yorktown, while more fortunate, was not unscathed. She took a bomb at the base of her island's superstructure, but quick damage control prevented the fires from spreading and she was soon back in commission and able to operate both her aircraft and the homeless ones left by the loss of her sister carrier. Fletcher then withdrew his forces towards Noumea, and the damaged carrier was sent back to Pearl Harbor for repairs. This battle, the first major opposed action fought between carrier groups, was mixed in terms of results. In terms of losses, the Americans came off the worst, having lost one of the very few large carriers in exchange for the relatively small Shoho. It is often stated that this was a strategic victory for the U.S., however, as the Port Moresby invasion force was turned back. This is overstated. One, the invasion force was not withdrawn from the area, but landed and joined the Japanese already on New Guinea, and participated in the overland advance across the Owen Stanley Mountains. Second, the Japanese received at most a setback here, and had effectively eliminated the American naval threat to their advances in the Solomons and towards Australia. The move on New Guinea may have been paused, but the occupation of the islands in the southwest Pacific was certainly not impeded, and the only force capable of effectively opposing it, the American Terrier task groups, had been driven from the area. Before we conclude, one unique feature of the employment of the SBD in this battle must be noted. This was the use of these two-seater dive bombers to supplement the air defense of the carrier groups. The Americans used 23 SBDs in a fighter role in the Coral Sea battle. Eight of these came from VS-5 and were dubbed the Inner Air Patrol. They were led by Lieutenant Roger Woodhull and given the task of protecting the carriers against Japanese torpedo planes. These were unable to prevent the torpedo planes from attacking their intended targets as they were too fast for them. They became embroiled in a furious air battle with the accompanying Zero fighters. Four Dauntlesses were shot down by the Japanese. The Americans claimed four Zero shot down, including three by a single aircraft, that of Lieutenant Stanley Vegteza. The Lexington's air group also retained their fighter role Dauntlesses in a similar inner air patrol. Three of these were lost in the course of the battle, including one which was wrecked while trying to land on the stricken carrier's tilted flight deck. The SBD crews claimed 11 Japanese planes in exchange, though this is probably greatly exaggerated. Altogether, the Dauntless has claimed 35 air-to-air victories while flying defense in this manner. The use of the dive bombers in this role was harshly criticized. It was felt, were it not for the successively cautious and wasteful use of the SBDs in this manner, they could have been used in the offense to achieve a total victory. Certainly, 23 more dive bombers might have been enough to finish off the Shikaku, and perhaps hurt her sister as well. It must be borne in mind that the American commanders did not have the benefit of hindsight, or the vast experience in carrier warfare that they were to accumulate in the coming years. The U.S. Navy's forces were at their slimmest at this time, and the loss of two carriers in the Coral Sea would represent a disaster of the first magnitude. The enormous fleets that would be at America's command in the Pacific were still being laid down at the time, and a successful Japanese thrust to the southwest would cut them off from Australia, the vital staging area for the planned Allied counterstroke in the Pacific, and allow the Japanese Empire to consolidate its hold on its recently won island bases. Preservation of their scarce assets would seem to be very reasonable under these circumstances. In any case, the Americans did learn from this experience, and though these would be far from the last air-to-air battles the SBDs would fight, it was the last time they were explicitly employed as daylight fighters. And so, I think this is a good place to end this episode. I hope you found some of what I had to say here interesting or useful. Next time we look at the SBD's wartime career, we'll take a detailed look at what was perhaps the most important battle that they fought in, the actions at Midway, in which the American dive bomber squadrons flying the Dauntless would make a critical contribution to the course of the Pacific War. We'll also take a look at some of their actions in the course of the vicious battles around the waters of Guadalcanal. Next time, however, we'll continue with our series on the Rif War fought in the Spanish Protectorate of Morocco. We'll discuss the impact of the Premo de Rivera coup in the course of the Moroccan War, and examine the new approach the Spanish would take to this bloody and persistent colonial conflict. I'd like to apologize to my listeners for the delay in the preparation of this episode. This is a busy time of year for me in real life, and I've only had a limited amount of time to devote to the podcast. Things seem to be letting up, however, so hopefully we'll be back on track shortly. Until then, I remain Mark Seven, wishing you all the best.